Hi guys, and welcome to this uh, episode of the Fret Success Guitar Show. Today is quite a special one. We're talking about some quite unique amplifiers, and it's not something I've done in the past. Uh, just got a, a friend on who's uh, quite into these amps and knows a lot about the history and the story. Uh, so I've got my friend Stephen Duggins here. Hello. <laughs> it's uh, good to have you on. Uh, just thought I'd uh, introduce you and uh, we can talk a little bit about the amp later, but I kind of would be intrigued to know a bit more about your story and what, what that has involved in terms of uh, as a musician and a performer and where you've been and done. And good Lord. Lord. Briefly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where do I start? Yeah, playing the violin age 11. <laughs> I was in Lincolnshire County Youth Orchestra and that kind of thing, and then decided violins were not uh, cool enough, so I eventually moved, as everyone does, moved to the guitar. Uh, yeah, and then um, just that was more of a hobby, and then when I moved to Cambridge in the UK, I wanted to join a band originally, and well, I wanted to start one, and I found an ad that looked <laughs> just in the, lo in the local paper. Yeah, or like on a forum somewhere uh, and uh, met with a guy who was looking to start a band that was very similar to what I was wanting to do. At that point I was actually playing the drums because I played the bass as well, but bass players are easy to come by. Just yeah. any low quality guitar player can play the bass. <laughs> <laughs> Drummers are always at a premium. Uh, Complaints so, in the comments below. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I started uh, that band uh, with a guy called James Parrish, who uh, is the owner of a music PR company. Oh, right. The offices in near Cambridge and also the only other office in London. They're called Prescription PR. Okay. Use them for all your PR needs. Okay. Uh, and so we started a band. Uh, we recruited a chemist <laughs> to play the bass <laughs> uh, called Ben. He was Welsh. So, I mean, there you go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just slagging off everyone now. It's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, so yeah, he played the bass, and we uh, cobbled some songs together, uh, mainly written by James because he's uh, he won't mind me saying he's uh, something of a musical savant, and that he can come up with good stuff. Okay. But you, it, it's quite hard to show him something that you have worked on, <laughs> and him to, to join in there. So well, that band uh, was called the Tube of Ghost, and. We uh, went through some lineup changes uh, in force because Ben, being a chemist and uh, actually in the pharmaceutical industry and a drug designer, had to go and spend three months working in Belgium. Mm -hmm. So when he did that, we drafted in uh, a drummer called Andy Jenkin, who runs a studio in London now. He's a recording engineer. I've forgotten the name of the studio, but uh, Google Andy Jenkin for all your recording needs. Uh, uh, he's recorded uh, like the last Tell Us an album and some other good okay. stuff if people are into their uh, slightly old underground UK guitar music. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so he was a drummer in a sort of uh, screamo hardcore band called uh, Days Ago, who were based in Norwich. He came to drum in that band and I moved on to the bass, proving that anyone can play the bass. <laughs> and then when Ben got back from Belgium, he took up second guitar and we had far more um, success in that lineup released some EPs and stuff, and then I uh, moved to Canada for work. So I abandoned that band and they were almost instantly then signed to a bigger label. <laughs> right, <laughs> okay. made a proper video and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> yeah. uh, using my bass in the video, which was never seen again, so. Oh, right, theft. I mean, if, well, I don't want to <laughs> <laughs> accuse someone, no, uh, it kind of got lost. Um, it was used by various people who filled in on oh, bass right. while they, uh, because uh, at the same time I moved to Canada, Ben moved to uh, France to work in Switzerland, to, like a cross border thing, mm -hmm. to Los Angeles. So uh, they drafted in a new uh, guitar player and a sort of revolving carousel of bass players, including um, Hank um, Henry from uh, TTNG, okay. who are a band of some renown. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he played one or two shows with them, and somewhere in between all this stuff, my my lovely bass got lost. So. Oh. So that was that. Uh, then I moved here and I started a variety of uh, unsuccessful bands, played shows, doing all kinds of stuff, mainly playing the guitar. Mm -hmm. When I moved here, I picked up um, my first kind of uh, vintage amp when I moved here, which is a uh, Fender Bassman 100. It's a, a 72, a silver face, but it has been 
um, the unfortunate term is black-faced. <laughs> okay. yeah. So the innards have been uh, sort of altered, so it has a lot more of the, so it's reverted to the, the, the black face circuitry, so it has a tube rectifier rather than solid state, and all the various things that um, went wrong with the silver face yeah, yeah. Uh, amps have been corrected. But the bass player in the back, the fuzzy light, of course, Rob Manlow, the drummer in, he, it was his amp, and he was from Vancouver, and, but living in Cambridge, and his amp was being used by a Boston tribute band, from which it was, <laughs> I don't know whether I rescued it or what, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, and that, uh, that thing is, well certainly the cab that comes with it is very, very large, and the first weekend I had a car in Canada, I drove from Calgary to Vancouver, for like 13 hours, picked it up and stayed overnight, and then drove back <laughs> the, the first day. weekend. The first weekend I had a car. Oh, right. Not the first weekend I was in, <laughs> in, uh, in Canada, but it was probably within the first five weeks of me in Canada. I'll fetch that. That's, uh, yeah, that comes with the, uh, the what is referred to as the pyramid cab, which is a 4x12, but if you take the, the front grille off, the speakers are all pointed inwards to give it a. I think the, it was targeted so it would sound best 80 feet away from the cab. Um, it's a much derided design that they didn't repeat, <laughs> uh, with, probably with good reason, but it's, um, it used to at least create a bit of a stir when you wheeled it into shows. Well, of course, yeah. Things about yay big. And, uh, I was in a band called uh, I Kill You, and we tended to set up on the floor, because we thought we were lightning bolt, and uh, <laughs> people would always be mugging in front of the amp and giving it all this business, <laughs> which is always fun. Uh, yeah, and then uh, that band kind of died. I was in a band that played very few gigs with my wife, <laughs> <laughs> and then had a band called uh, Hit Dice, uh, and then we, uh, from that, me and David from Hit Dice, are now in a band with uh, Kevin, who I believe we've been to. <laughs> yes, yes, Kevin was on the last show. <laughs> called uh, Fulfillment, and I now play the drums in that mm -hmm. band that have turned my attention from buying vintage amplifiers to buying drum equipment. <laughs> So you love buying equipment, you've got quite a lot of equipment, and it tends to be the older vintages, 60s, 70s type? Uh, yeah, my amps are certainly that. I mean, the amp we're here to really talk about and focus on is the Ranger Sun amps, as we've got in your t-shirt there. That's right. <laughs> um, so I know very little about Sun amps. Um, so I'd love to know as much as you can tell me, really, because I know that the viewers will really want to hear um, exactly the story of that. Quite a unique story, I believe, um, in some ways. And uh, yeah, so if you can kind of take us through what you kind of know and appreciate from the amps. And... Well, Sun amps, I think, uh, today are perhaps more famous in association with the band Sun, mm -hmm. which is like whenever I wear this t-shirt, yeah. people are like, is that for the, well, because people who know the band Sun tend to know Sun amps, so they ask, is that for the band or the amp? And I kind of yeah. pull the old switcheroo on them and whichever one they <laughs> guess, I say, no, it's the other one. <laughs> You clown. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the band Sun, which is uh, Greg Anderson and Steve O'Malley, they've been around since the late 90s, and anyone who knows their oeuvre knows that they just play monolithic slabs of guitar through a particular Sun amplifier, the uh, uh, Model T, which comes fairly, it's about in the middle towards, yeah, middle towards the end of the Sun story. But those are some very mighty um, amps, and that particular sound that they get out of them is basically what the entire band is built on, and that's why they name themselves after the right. after the amp brand, complete with the logo. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, yeah, sure. They always end, so you know, people refer to them as Sun O, but mm -hmm. technically it is. Uh, so the story of Sun Amps is a long and interesting <laughs> one. <laughs> well, that's why we're here. Yeah, yeah uh, so it's also tied in with a very famous song, the song Louie Louie. Louie Louie, oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Might be, but yeah. that song, so that was originally uh, the, the, the famous version uh, that um, you hear on the radio all the time. Well, not all the time, depends on radio station, isn't it? But uh, that's by a band called The Kingsman, well, from Portland. But it's actually a cover of a song from the mid 50s that was recorded by Richard Berry. So the famous version is by The Kingsman from Portland, and the bass player in that band um, is uh, Norm Sunholm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can already see the sun hole. Yeah. You can see where the storm is coming. Creeping in. Yeah. So uh, they had uh, they released that in 1963, and it was a huge nationwide hit uh, and beyond, obviously. But um, and they were booked to 
play like a huge tour the next year with lots of other of sort of the popular beat combos of the day. <laughs> <laughs> he worked in a music store and was using a 60 watt Bogan amp. That'd be funny to Australians, but it's uh, <laughs> uh, which is basically a PA amp, and that's what kind of bass players uh, of the day were using. Yep, yep. And they would play this sort of big tour, and they played the first, or they, they would play some, they played some larger venues before they went on this tour, and it was not loud enough. This was in the days before sort of comprehensive uh, sort of PA equipment mm -hmm. that everyone's used to nowadays. Uh, his brother Conrad Sundholm uh, was an electrical engineer. And uh, they put their heads together, and Conrad decided to boost the power by using a, uh, a preamp, a um, 60 watt preamp uh, built by a company called Dynaco, mm -hmm. who basically supplies kind of at home DIY hi fi enthusiasts. You could build your own uh, hi fi system. So he put one of those in front of the the Bogan PA amp, which basically just a power amp section. Also had some ideas about the speaker cabinet, the probably the most unique of which was to use a folded horn oh, right, in okay. the cabinet. So if you ever take apart the older Sun mm -hmm. cabs, a lot of them have this kind of folded oh, wow. weird horn for the high frequencies. Yeah, yeah. And he, his brother was using uh, a Fender 212 mm -hmm. uh, at the time with the, with the PA amp, but he built this sort of 2x15 uh, cabinet with JBL speakers, which were sort of the premium speaker of the day. Yeah, uh, been around a long time. Yeah, Fender even started selling their cabs with optional JBLs, mm -hmm. sort of uh, as they got late 60s into the 70s. So they built this setup and it seemed to work pretty well. So they went off, or Norm went off with the Kingston on this tour and Lots of the other bass players they played with and other people thought, this sounds fantastic. Well, uh, how, how did you make this and explain the story? And when he got back off the tour, he said to, to Conrad, we should, uh, we should build these and sell them. Uh, people are crying out for a fantastic yeah. bass amp. It uh, had a lot of headroom, it was very clear. It did a lot lower frequencies than uh, anything anyone else was using. So they built a few in the garage and they managed to sell them and orders kept rolling in. So they decided they couldn't sort of keep up Mm -hmm. by themselves, build them in a the garage, they took on industrial premises in Portland mm -hmm. and started sort of manufacturing them properly. The, the first uh, models, they named them after the, <laughs> the JVL speakers right. and then like a, an initial and then the power, so they would have names like 30A40 mm -hmm. because that was the JVL 130, 15-inch yep. uh, speaker, uh, A just because of the iteration and then the, the wattage was last. So. Then in 1967, after they'd been building them for a, a few years, Norm left the music industry to become a real estate agent. <laughs> it's okay. So often the way. <laughs> uh, at which point Conrad uh, took sole ownership of the company and he changed the logo to the famous. Mm -hmm. uh, this logo before, the, if you find a very early sun amp, they, actually, they literally have a picture of like a happy smiling sun oh, really? next to the word sun, oh. which is a far less intimidating, <laughs> far less kind of cool logo than uh, yeah. uh, sort of the iconic one that uh, I'm wearing there. Yeah. Um, in fact, my own sun amp is kind of built at the cusp of that time. It's built in 1967. So while it has this logo on the outside, the, they were still running through their, uh, their inventory of the serial numbers. They had like little stick on metal plates and that still has the old sun logo. Oh, on right, okay. Side. I'm not sure they've had the same success. <laughs> Or the same sort of... Uh, probably They not. probably wouldn't be on t-shirts if they, they still had the happy smiling... I wonder why that even... I mean, I understand the reason behind it, mm -hmm. but surely just the name would be enough to start. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, they had to add an extra N to yeah. the Sun because they found out they were just to be called like the Sun Electrical Company or the Sun Music Company, but they found out there was already a Sun mm. Electrical Company with one N, which was a company that... I think they tested electrical automotive parts. Oh, right, okay. So it's not even in the same field, but... They decided to add the extra N because mm -hmm. the, the sun horn in their name is, uh, is just the, the one N. So yeah, Conrad uh, takes over the company entirely. He sort of modifies the designs a bit more. So that's when they started, um, they abandoned the previous uh, naming system and went with the first kind of amps that you still see around nowadays, the 100S, the 200S. These all had bass and guitar amps were sold with 15 inch speakers. Yeah. So they I mean, that's fairly unusual itself. You don't see many guitar cast with 15 inch really. speakers anymore. You I guess that came from the, the PA, that's more PA. Yeah, he just really loved the, the JBL 130F speaker, yep. which is a, a 15 inch speaker. So like 
they shipped everything with them. There was a some modification uh, to the speaker cone. They put like struts on for the bass ones just to okay. to hold it so you didn't get so much of the high frequency mm -hmm. uh, end of it. They were a bit more rigid, but yeah. the 100S, which is the guitar version, the 200S, which is the bass version, and then they expanded the line after 67 to uh, sort of try and cover all the, the bases of who would be buying. So there was some uh, more powerful, uh, especially on the bass line amps, and then some smaller ones. They even sold some in combo, but if you look at the, the old catalog, as you can see, they're basically <laughs> the heads nailed to the, wow. <laughs> to the cabs. Um, and they also, which is uh, kind of unusual marketing tool, is they would sell the same amp mm -hmm. head, uh, but they would stick a different badge on it depending on what cab it was sold with. Oh, right. Okay. So the 100S, which is the amp I have, um, was generally was called that when it was sold with a, a 1x15 cab with the horn in, but that same head was sold as the, was it the Spectrum, I think it was, or something if it was sold in combo and it was called something else, like the Sona or something, and it was sold with a 2x15, so... All right, so they spent a lot of time naming these things. Well, it's the fun part, isn't it? <laughs> well, I guess so, once you put the, the sun on the logo as well. Yeah, so you've got you go? identical amps being sold under different names, depending on what cab they're paired with, so... Mm. Uh, that was uh, all fun and games. These amps have a ton of headroom, they're mm -hmm. very clean, and they were very loud, and they sort of would they'd furnish touring bands though when they came through. So fairly soon, like The Who, Jimi Hendrix Experience, Buffalo Springfield, mm -hmm. other bands of that type. Well, <laughs> the, the big bands of the time, really. Yeah, they were, they, stuck, they picked up this Sun stuff and were touring with it. Then, and they became kind of a, a hip and trendy brand mm -hmm. as these things go. This drew the attention of a Minneapolis industrialist called Bill Hartzell, uh, who owned a company called Hartzell Industries, and he bought Sun amplifiers and sort of just threw his financial weight behind them so uh, they could uh, produce more. He actually moved the production of the speaker cabinets to a factory he already owned in Kentucky, a larger sort of operation, but left Conrad building and designing the amps, mm -hmm. uh, the heads in, uh, in Portland. His aim was to sort of grow the business, sell tons of these amps everywhere and make a fortune. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, also in 1971, uh, this kind of sees the emergence uh, in the UK of Marshall amplifiers yeah, with so. higher gain, they break up and give the sort of lovely rich distortion at far lower volumes, mm -hmm. which is something that those sun amps do not do. Mm -hmm. If you absolutely crank them, they do have that lovely breakup, but you have to be playing super loud. That kind of distorted general sort of lovely rich breakup sound wasn't what course, most bands were built for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're sort of playing your mm, just think of the song Louie Louie that the kids yeah. were famous for. Mm -hmm. All this kind of, like the Bobby Fuller 4, all this kind of stuff that's just clear. Yeah. It's loud, played rock and roll, but it's kind of, it doesn't have that kind of, that rich, distorted guitar tone, isn't yeah, what it's they're not after. Compressed kind of song. Yeah, but you can, I mean, that's what I was using, well, what I use my, <laughs> my son for. If you really crank the hell out of it and turn up the uh, magical contour button, which okay. is the mids, yeah. then, um, uh, in large part, use the, the tube rectifier in it. Mm -hmm. Then, as you uh, sort of really load it up, um, you get the sag and that compression, so you do get that. And of course, it's great with pedals in front of it, but at the time, that was not what uh, suddenly people were after. Yeah. Marshall was suddenly the, <laughs> the new thing. So, within six months of Bill Hartzell buying the company, they swiftly fall out of, as quickly as they'd been adopted as the hit brand. Wow. They were now no longer the hit brand, which was a bit of a disaster for Bill. So. Uh, <laughs> His idea then, rather than to sort of go sort of match like with like and try and regain that market and make those kind of amplifiers, he went the other way and tried to make cheaper amplifiers. Okay. So, and this is what Sun was sort of became known for for a while, was the solid state amplifiers. Mm -hmm. So they are nearly all black. They have basically this the red logo on them. Yeah, yeah. Strange names like the Coliseum and the Concert Bass and all kinds of uh, weird names, but not being a musician himself, Bill Hartzell figured that like cheaper, lighter, mm -hmm. and carry them everywhere, they got more power. Yep. People all love them, and people did not love them. <laughs> uh, especially these sort of high-end touring musicians that Sun Amp had sort of made their name with. So uh, this was a bit of a disaster for Sun, and it kind of, that move into the solid state amps kind of tarnished their mm -hmm. reputation for many years afterwards, even though those amps themselves now 
in the cycle of musical fashion are now quite sought after by certain types of bands, sort of uh, noise bands like to stack them in, <laughs> use several of them together because you can, oh, they are right. immensely loud. Um, a band from New York called, I don't know, still around, called Suffering Bastard, who used to just use an absolute pile of them, and that was wow. quite the sight to see. <laughs> and there's still plenty of them around, you can pick them up on eBay, not for 150 bucks. So. Wow, that's quite a good value. Well, you'd think <laughs> that, that they might have switched to more of focusing on like the bass guitar market? And... Uh, they could have done, and that is like the bookend of the, the Sun story, mm -hmm. is a, a really good bass amp they made. As I say, Bill Hartz running the company, it was all a musician. Conrad was happy tinkering with, they still made uh, tube amps, but they, they focused far more on marketing these new, light, powerful, take them anywhere. <laughs> well, that uh, was the way it, it has kind of gone, really. Like, there's, especially in the bass market, there's mm -hmm. like when you get the Mark bass amps, they mm -hmm. like, throw them around, kind of yeah. thing. It's just maybe at the wrong time, that's unfortunate. Cause maybe he was just ahead of his time. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, yeah. Because uh, not today, but I'm going to be testing out the amp and running it through its paces. So it's what to hear what it sounds like. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how loud you've got to crank it to get some crunch out of it. But uh, chuck a few pedals in front of it and see. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I we always use a little um, MXR micro amp just to boost yep. the signal. Crank works, it. works, Brilliant. works yeah. really well. And you stick anything like a like a big muff or a rat in front of it. And so this was also this kind of solid state period is also when Sun uh, made the amp for which the band Sun is made, which is the Sun Model T. Okay. They made this from 73 to 75, mm -hmm. told my head. Uh, it's a 150 watt all tube. Wow, um, that's like a lot eight, eight bits of glass <laughs> in it. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, this was more of a high gain thing. It had that kind of Marshall uh, Fender basement kind of circuit in it. They sold, they actually made two versions of it. There's, the Model T 72, 75, and then they modified it 75 to later in the 70s, 77, 79, something like that. That the second iteration is not as sought after. The mm -hmm. ones that Sun run of about sort of eight of <laughs> on the stage at a time are the 73 to 75 Model Ts, and partly because they're great amps, and partly because of the popularity of Sun using them. And now everyone, not everyone, but now sort of those kind of drum metal bands, that's kind of the standard amp to have. Okay. So, like, they run to three or four thousand wow. US dollars mm -hmm. to pick one up second hand. So. so with the valve orientation, was it like four and four kind of thing? Or? They were, yeah, they were like a double tube preamp, then the phase split one, then they had tube rectifiers, then they had uh, two pairs of power uh, power tubes at sure. the back end. So okay, yeah. The full eight and eight? Yeah, eight bits of glass in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So plenty of wallop. Whereas, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, the 100S mine is done is like a fast small affair to mm. 60 watts, which has got a single preamp tube, then the, uh, the phase split has a tube rectifier, two power tubes, so it still rattles windows, but it's not going to kill anyone. <laughs> like, it's still, it's still pretty <laughs> loud, it's because uh, valve power, and uh, so the, the preamp valves, are the, what kind of valves would they be in your... Yeah, the 100S has a 7025 preamp tube, oh, okay. uh, has, um, yeah, the phase inverter is 6AN8, has mm -hmm. the GZ34 rectifier tube and then two uh, KT88s, the, oh, yeah, the yeah. Gold Lion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, who were originally these, the British made ones. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in that, so that's the, what's in the one I have. Yeah, they've got a sound of their own then, 88s. So. Yeah, I mean, they later shifted to like a uh, US made 6550s. Oh, right, okay. Sort of, I don't know whether it became harder to obtain Probably. the British ones or just more expensive yeah. to. Yeah, well, a lot of the factories shut down, didn't they? But we're making these changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the Sun story then takes a tragic turn. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was quite a long period though. They started, what, 65 ish? That was uh, really commercially making them uh, 60, yeah, making them for sale 65. Uh, um, 73 was when they were starting to do these. Yeah, 71 really to 73, they started the solid state yeah. era mm -hmm. and making the Model T. Mm -hmm. And they just kind of uh, plotted along um, selling, no, sort of not. Uh, a cool name, not doing tons mm -hmm. of business, scarcely making any money mm -hmm. for Mr. Hartzell, and then he died in a plane crash. Oh, God. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> uh, uh, sometime in the mid 80s, 81, 82, something like that, and uh, his estate, that was basically the end of 
Sun Amplifiers mm -hmm. in that form, his estate, his company, they did, they had far more profitable other lines of business. This was basically a hobby mm -hmm. almost of Bill Hartzell's um, owning the, the amplifier business. So as his estate and his company was broken up, um, Sun Amplifiers basically died and the, the name Sun was then bought by FMC, Fender, mm -hmm. who, uh, in 1984. Why did they do that? Because it probably cost them about two bucks or something. Oh yeah, 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 but cheap, but like. But then they um, they started making okay, uh, they did amps, with it. Uh, branded as Sun. Um, yeah, in the uh, sort of mid eighties, um, up until like two thousand and two, they still made uh, Sun amps. Mm -hmm. uh, not none of them particularly fantastic. Well, one of them was fantastic. <laughs> but the reputation is still suffering from. Most people then didn't know Sun for. Their early amps, all for the Model Ts, they just, because there were a lot more Sun solid state amps around, ah, okay, so yeah, people yeah. saw them a lot more and went, yeah, they're okay, but they're nothing yeah. special. So the attempt to sort of um, resurrect the brand didn't really take off. They, Fender did try to market, like, made some pretty beefy old tube amps under mm -hmm. the Sun name, including the, uh, they actually uh, sort of reissued the Model T, but it wasn't the same amp. Okay. It wasn't the same design, it just looked, it looks pretty similar, <laughs> but it's not the same amp. But they made a, a 300 watt version uh, for the base called the 300T, and when they retired the surname in 2002, they were like, well, this amp is pretty decent. Mm -hmm. So they Fender Basin 300 from 2002 to, I don't know when they changed the design, but that was basically the, the Sun model 300T. They just rebadged it as a basement 300 and you know, 300 all two watts of base power is yeah. not to be seen then. Okay. They also made, <laughs> uh, for a while, a like a sort of rack mounted base amp called the 1200S that was exactly that number of watts. It okay. was 12. <laughs> um, was that a solid amp as well? Uh, no, I think that was um, a, a tube amp. Like oh, a, right, wow. um, so why, you can, you can that edit that out if I'm lying, but I think that was a 1200 watt the tube. Which, I mean, well, Ampeg makes some that get yeah, up in that area, but that was probably that one of the most powerful amps ever made. Mm -hmm. um, but still, there were no real takers for it. So. so, how did you find out about Sun Amps? What was well, I actually knew about Sun Amps from the band Sun. Like right, oh, you, you read into the story. Yeah, yeah, and I read, and I sort of knew which amps they used, uh, the Model T, but. Then in sort of reading about the Model T, I discovered they made these earlier amps and the whole story about it. And then, uh, yeah, um, a few years ago, I saw the chance to buy one from a doctor living in Edmonton. <laughs> if you're watching, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Who uh, <laughs> was, uh, yeah, selling that. And um, funnily enough, initially, I didn't actually um, go and buy it myself. I had a friend who was in Edmonton mm -hmm. pick it up and uh, bring it back for me. But uh, when I was like, oh, so I'm going to sort of look at the history of my particular model, the 100S actually came in two uh, versions. The in 1967, the four knob version, as uh, it's referred to, which is what I have, which is just has volume, uh, treble, bass, and contour, which is okay. the mids, and yep. contour is really where the it's like the if you, comes in. Yes, if you <laughs> if you turn <laughs> contour all the way, like roll it all the way off, it's like yeah, this is okay, and it's when you roll it on the mitts when the, the magic happens okay. and things in your house start rattling at strange frequency. The the seven knob version that replaced it had like a built-in tremolo and uh, reverb as well. And that's what the extra knobs controlled. So when was that? When did they start to That was like sixty eight, so okay. they, they didn't have a four knob version for very long. So because the the tremolo reverb tremolo was quite popular kind of getting <laughs> to that era, wasn't it? It was a fixture on a lot of American amps really. Yeah. So they, they obviously there was space in the chassis to stick one. Oh, <laughs> they course, were, yeah. So uh, they went with that. Um, so yeah, mine's uh, sort of early '67, as they say. Still has the old mm -hmm. smiley face sun logo on the inside, which is fun. But the 100S was sold with a uh, a one by fifteen cabinet with a horn in JBL. Um, made both of those, and I looked at my cab and I was like, well, oh, this that doesn't seem kind of quite the right size. <laughs> like the the 100S you see pictures of, I just have found uh, old catalogues of it and it's a very kind of tall thin thing whereas mine is a bit more squat looking and I was like oh, okay. something's wrong 
here. Yeah. And it was also making a funny rattling sound. So I took the back off. It was like this is old fashioned proper engineering. So it's got like 24 screws or something <laughs> holding, holding the back in. And inside, uh, lo and behold, there's no horn. I'm like, well, oh, right. I've got a hornless cab here. It's madness. And also, uh, I noticed the speaker was not a JBL speaker. It was a different 15-inch uh, speaker, which was which is just branded Sun Transducer. So oh, right. that's a bit strange. So I did a bit more <laughs> sort of digging around. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, the clue as to what I actually had was the dimensions of the cab. They only made one cab in this sort of smaller squat. It's like, to us now, it looks like a cab should look. It's kind of, yep. it's not quite square, but it's uh, more square than it is kind of very tall and thin, which yep. is a lot of the Sun cabs were at that time. And sort of looking through your catalogs, what the cab is, is the, the standalone 1x15 cab for the base amp sold as the Sun Sonado. Mm -hmm. So, and that came without a horn and with a 15 inch uh, speaker. Okay. And so that was only made from, it was only made in like 1969, uh, at which time it should have had a JBL speaker in. But Sun did switch in 1970, 71 from, they switched away from the JBLs to what they branded, what they put the sticker on as Sun Transducers, but they were actually uh, sort of, they were just buying them from elsewhere. They were Eminence and CTS stuff, yeah. uh, speakers awesome. that they just rebranded as Sun Transducer. Uh, so I have a 1967 guitar head with a 1968 or 9 bass cab with a 1971 bass speaker in, which was blue. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> Luckily, <laughs> Eminence, uh, good guys that they are, still make a 15 inch uh, guitar speaker, the okay. Eminence Legend yeah. 1518, I think it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and that actually handles a lot more power than the original mm -hmm. fan speakers. So, I got one of those, stuck it in there, and it sounds fantastic. So, and it's obviously not going to blow again. And <laughs> something goes terribly wrong because Things rated 150 watts and it's only dealing with 60 cents. So, what kind of sound does yours have? <laughs> well, we seem to be glib. It's loud, but it's uh, because it's uh, the design of it, uh, it's kind of almost like a, until you really crank it, it's like a blank slate. Whatever you, it really show, shows the character of whatever guitar you're putting in front mm -hmm. of it. It comes through more than um, maybe amps that are have more of their own distinct character that people are, mm -hmm. are looking for. So this is a, uh, yeah, it's very clear, lots of headroom, plenty of volume until you really give it the business, especially with the contour turned up, then it has a lot of lovely, rich mid action. So that happens if you crank the contour a bit more, it gives you a bit more of that grip. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, yeah, uh, you just get all kinds of crazy overtones coming out when you turn the mid zone, which is I'm not entirely sure what else that does, it can't. I'm suspicious it's not just mids that it's doing something else, but what it's actually doing, I don't know. Could be doing a few things, uh, could be driving the speaker differently. Yeah, I have various different guitars sticking in front of it. I have a Kramer DMZ 2000, which okay. is really sweet. It's got the aluminium, aluminum oh. neck. <laughs> heavy. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> heavy as anything. Yeah. And uh, then I've got um, so 1979, also from 79, I have uh, so Ovation, the guitar company, mm -hmm. more famous for their kind of curved back uh, semi-acoustic guitars. They did briefly in the late 70s and early 80s uh, take a run at solid body electric guitars. Mm -hmm. And they had um, a couple of models, the most popular of which is the Viper. And I have one of those, which is mm -hmm. a very, very noisy guitar. <laughs> they, uh, for some reason, they thought that the great marketing thing would be if they had like super hot pickups in there. So. While it does sound very good, if you're not, if you don't want that sound, <laughs> if you don't want that sound or if you're facing the wrong way in the Earth's magnetic field, oh, your, course, your, yeah. your amp will make an almighty din of its own volition. <laughs> so you definitely need a noise gate <laughs> with that one. With that one. So those are the two um, main guitars I've used. So do you find you have to shape the sound at all, you know, either going in or, I know it's got bass and treble, mm -hmm. uh, how do you, do you find, I know you use the contour, it sounds like a lot. Yeah, to be honest, the <laughs> bass and treble don't seem to do a whole lot. Okay. Well, you obviously, with the 15 inch speaker, you don't want to uh, play out the bass up 
too high because yeah. you get a lot of that um, coming through, especially uh, the way I used it in um, the bands I played in. I was going for a kind of, uh, <laughs> say screechy, but I was going for a very kind of uh, trebly sound. Mm -hmm. We had, as uh, David, our bass player, still uses in Fulfillment, he likes a lot of made in his bass yeah, um, sure. sound um, and distortion there. and. When we first started that band, we also had uh, sort of synthesizers in there as well. So in order not to be in everyone's way, I just went up into <laughs> lots of trebly stuff. Yeah, well, yeah, you have to fit in frequency wise as well. Exactly. So, uh, and, yeah, I remember when we recorded the EP. <laughs> the guy recording, he said, do you want the guitar sound to be that annoying? And I was like, yes, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm after. <laughs> in isolation, it's a pretty it's a grating sound. Yeah. But you can get quite a lot of, like, with a few pedals in front of it if you turn the bass and the contour mm -hmm. all the way up and roll the treble off and stick a, a big muff in front of it you can you can almost imagine you're in sun <laughs> uh, using a model t as you uh, go along there is that so, what you kind of do your setup tends to be putting the big muff in front and uh, uh the big muff is fun just to to muck around with yeah, yeah, yeah. Home just to oh, of course sort of yeah it's got that kind of sound play it being a guitar yeah. god and <laughs> the yeah. huge thing but except when I've played in bands, they're mainly sort of punky or post-punk bands. Mm -hmm. So that kind of more cutting, yeah, more top less, end yeah, yeah, less, less a big yeah. bloom of sound and more kind of a sort of concise range that you're mm -hmm. looking for to cut through the rhythmy stuff. So you're not looking for like rich, creamy leads mm -hmm. or similarly, you're not playing like big booming chords. It's a lot of more rhythmic stuff. You need that sort of the chop and the cut higher up. But if you also want to muck around and... <laughs> it sounds quite versatile. You, yeah, you I mean, that's what it is. I mean, it's yeah, clear and loud, so it's not... You can basically put anything you want in front of it and get it to do what you want, so... So you were saying you picked the amp up for like $150, was it? No, that's the solid state amp. The solid state, I, oh, okay. What did I pay for that? It was under market value, okay. certainly. It was more like about 950 Canadian, so... Okay. But that was with the speaker. With the, with the mismatched uh, yeah. cab, but if you look on Reverb, you can see they tend to go for a lot more than that, so mm -hmm. it was fairly lucky on that one. So. Right, so now we're going to go through a little uh, audio demo. I'm going to play uh, it through the amp, take it through its paces, um, put some pedals in front of it and such, so uh, have a listen and check this section out here. So Stephen was kind enough to lend me his... Uh, Sun amp, and I'm not going to be able to do a full test because this thing is so loud. Um, so if you're in the Calgary area, um, just maybe, you know, within the nearest 20 miles or something, you might want to just uh, close your doors and windows and things. Um, this is a monster amp. Uh, I'm going to run through a few tones. So I'm going to take you through the clean modes, and then um, I can't really crank the amp too loud because. It's just a monster. I mean, I've got the amp set on two at the moment and I'll push it as far as I can, but it's really hard to get it to break up fully, um, which is understandable because of the kind of amp it is. Um, so I've got a rat put in, in front of the guitar. That's all I've got in the chain. Um, playing through PRS Custom 24, go through a few different pickups uh, and a few different lick styles. And yeah, I'll see what you think. I'll twiddle the uh, functions on the front of the amp and uh, yeah, check it out. Little demo of the Sun amp. This is great, 100S. So we'll go through the clean tone first. Um, here we've just got the volume set to two, which is very low. Um, but this thing's a beast, even though it's you know, you know, a relatively low power amp for the for the valve scene. Uh, and then we've got the treble, the bass, this contour knob here. So I'll go through each of those settings now. But I've got it pretty neutral at the moment. So the treble there, the bass there, bang in the middle at five. Thought that was pretty neutral. And we'll just play a few chords uh, and yeah. See what they sound like, so. So quite a mellow sound. I've got it on the neck pickup here. We'll just switch to the bridge pickup. You can hear there's quite a lot of articulation there. Um, it's quite nicely ringing there, nothing's too muddied, um, so it's nice and clean and clear. If we switch to the kind of pair of pickups. Jangly sound, uh, which is nice. Um. It's 
It's a nice, clean, preserved top end. I, I like the sound of that. It's nice and smooth, not too harsh. So we'll start to tweak the sounds a little bit here. Um, I'm going to keep it on the bridge pickup, I think, actually, for this little demo. Uh, and we'll just crank the volume a little bit on this clean sound and see how we get. So we'll go up to three. So we'll crank the volume just a little bit, and it's amazing what power you can get out of this thing. And the thing I love there is that the top end is still very preserved and clean and just chiming away just nicely. And that's just banging neutral settings. You know, that, that's all it really is. So we'll just crank it just a little bit more because I'm feeling dangerous. So we're starting to get a little bit more of a compressed sound and that's just them power amps just kicking in. You can hear if I strum quite hard, giving us a bit more crunchy sound, which is gonna be making a nice solid lead tone. And it just gives that extra bit of color to the clean sound really. Nice and clean, but full sound. Go up a little bit further. I'm feeling five might be my limit here. So we're getting a nice breakup there happening now. We can actually start to play some meatier chords here. And that's really getting pretty loud. <laughs> and we'll just push it just a little bit further to six, just briefly, and it's really getting a bit loud here. Get a nice, beautiful brown sound almost out of the guitar amp. I think if we go up to 10, we can hear things start to really pick up. And it's almost starting to sound a little bit like a fuzz amp. Uh, just giving that weird low end. I think pushing it to 10 is probably a bit much for this amp. Uh, I think it's just starting to overload, but it's got that sound if you want that character. Uh, it's really giving you that meaty kind of low end sound. So we'll back off again down to about three, just to keep everything nice and clean. So that's just pushing it nicely, all on the bridge pickup there. And even when we go to the neck pickup, we can hear if we go to that brief volume change. Nice and chimey back down to that clean sound. We push up to, say, five and a half. Feel that low end of the neck pickup, really bringing it through and making it kind of just chime and sing with that low end, just, just waiting to burst when you just push it that bit further. We go up to six and a half. So you hear it's starting to get a really brown, bluesy, kind of full low end sound. So what we'll do now is we'll go back to the clean sound. And we'll start to chime in some of these other effects. So it's very simple. We've only got bass, treble, and the contour. So we'll start to just push this contour. If we go up just a touch, maybe just give it a two of contour. We're starting to get this kind of high, kind of mid-range push and kind of a bell-shaped kind of honk to the sound. Um, and really when we start to push that a bit further, you make that a lot more prominent there. And it's starting to really sing and almost just have these overtones coming like harmonic content just kind of pushing it. If we go up to the top end of the contour, 
We're kind of probably getting a lot of like treble push there. But it's not too much. It's just got that nice bit of bite in the high mid range. It's just giving it a nice sound. And we're actually still at very low volumes three we're on there. So that kind of nice, punky, kind of in your face, you know, slapping you around kind of sound, which is, uh, you know, pretty cool. Let's back that contour back down again, see how we do on the neck pickup. Kind of that mellower low end is kicking in again just because of the neck pickup position. Um, we're on five there on the contour, so I'm just going to shape through that and you can hear really hear right sound. Contour five. I really like that clean sound. It's got like a low end beef to it and it's just got a chimey top end. It's nice. Go up to the 10. And on that neck pickup, it's just starting to push and distort it, kind of making it a bit muddy there. So I think that's a little bit much for the neck pickup. So if we go back to five, just nice and in the middle, bridge pickup. And we'll start to play with some of these treble and bass features and see how they sound. So let's push the treble just a little bit so it gives us a bit more high end. So you start to get that real singing overtone note kind of, the harmonics are really starting to come through when we push that treble just a bit. And what I love about this is this is just all amp, so it just sounds Pretty awesome. It's basically got bass and treble, that's all we're using, and a bit of this contour shaper. Um, and the top end is still, I thought it'd be a bit harsh, it's still just holding in there. So let's back that off just a bit to five again, and just push that bass. I just feel a bit excited about this low end going on. Oh, that sounds nice. It's just like this mellow kind of drive in the, in the kind of low mids. It's just got so much meat to it, it's unbelievable. If we just maybe leave that bass there, push the volume just a little touch, and I think we might just get a bit more bite to it. Ah, that is nice. Such a nice kind of punky tone that's coming through there. Let's push this bass really hard now. Let's see how we get on. So we're getting a little bit of muddiness in the low end there, but I think it's just holding in there because that's quite typical of guitar amps when you push their bass tone, you know, too far. So we'll just back that off. I've found playing with this amp a bit that the sweet spot seems to be just below seven. It's just giving that nice low end, just giving it enough push and not muddying it too much. So it's, it's nice. And I find the treble is just nice, just backed off from five. <laughs> But you've got to watch that contour switch because that gives you a little bit too much presence sometimes. This is quite a versatile amp considering that it's just got, you know, four knobs to turn and this contour thing that just does some incredible stuff to the amp. Just makes it sing with some nice overtone harmonics. It's really nice. Um, so let's back the treble off completely, see what sound we're getting. It's not really losing as much as I thought it would. It's not like when you roll the tone knob straight off. It's just giving it a bit of nice bit of presence still in the top end. I, I, I love this amp. It's just amazing. Really singing. I mean, if we back that contour switch off, we'll really see what it's doing. It 
it's it's really all about that contour knob. It's it really is. Just gives it that extra top end chime, which is just beautiful. <laughs> It's pretty awesome, let's, let's be truthful. I just think a little bit more treble, the bass about there, the contour just maybe pushed a little bit further for that distorted sound. Did you see when we back right the volume down to two? That just cleans up just nice, and if you just want to push it a little bit further, three. Just that little bit of change just gives it that nice kind of singing, like an, an orange kind of crunch sound. can really hear it's completely different to like a Marshall sound or something and that one 15 inch speaker there is I think that's given us a lot of the low frequency presence that's really helping give this amp quite a fat sound really so it's, it's pretty cool. Okay so I didn't want to do anything too complicated with this amp in terms of putting things between the guitar and the amp but I remember Stephen mentioning this, uh, you know, the, the rap pedal, which just gives that extra push. I mean, I love the rap pedal, and but you have to dial it in with the right sound because it can sound a bit muddy and a little bit harsh if you don't have it dialed in correctly. Um, it takes a little bit of playing with, but it is an awesome pedal if you just want to have this great distortion sound just with a click of a button. Um, and it just really complements the sound that you get. I mean, let's go through that now. So with the rat, I've got the distortion set on about let's say 11 o'clock, the filter's right the way around, getting to almost the end of the dial there at like four, four o'clock-ish. And the volume I've got kind of cruising where it's not really making any attenuation or boost to the sound. So I figured that out to be about uh, three o'clock. Uh, three buttons, uh, really simple, straight, straight through into the amp. It's uh, just keeping it very simple here. Uh, so I'll do this with the clean sound. And we'll put the rat on. So it's pretty awesome. A little bit too much top end maybe I think, just turn that treble down. I think just a bit too much bite on the top there. It's just got such versatile tone, going from this clean sound. And you can just hear where the rat is just complementing that, that tone coming from the amp. It's just giving that extra drive and kick. I just think it really sings with these kind of old fashioned late 90s, 2000s kind of heavy slash chords. It's just got a perfect amount of bite and low end and kick and it's just not too distorted and the amp just, I think that speaker's doing a lot and the, the, it's just an unreal machine this. Listen to that, the articulation that comes through from the amp, it's just doing the top end and the low end so tightly and so well, it's just a beast. I can understand why Stephen bought one of them. I 
I think the thing that shines for me is just the articulation of the notes that come through. And it's it's really all coming from the amp. You've got a rat going before it, but the amp is just superb. Chime that you get, just push that contour a little bit more. What a beautiful amp. It really is something else. I have nothing else to say. Uh, so it's been great to have you on, Stephen. Really appreciate your time, and uh, it's quite a unique story. Uh, I've learned a lot, and it's this kind of rise and fall story, uh, with ending with a plane crash. <laughs> it still kind of lives on with Fender kind of adopting it and taking it a little bit. Further. Yeah, they retired the name in 2002, so I suppose it did move on after the plane crash. But I mean, if you're if there is such a thing as a sun purist, they <laughs> don't consider those amps to be merely suns. Yeah, but there are some people. On, certain forums, as there always are, <laughs> who are, well, net forums are forums. Let's yeah, we're too far to into that. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been fantastic. Thanks for your time. I uh, appreciate it. Um, hope you guys enjoyed the content. Uh, like, subscribe, leave a comment if you have any questions, or I suggest just digging into the story of Sunamps a bit more. Um, thanks again, Stephen, and you can check out his uh, current band, Fulfillment. I'll drop the link here. And uh, yeah, thanks, guys. I'll see you next time. <laughs>